to the Hood Museum of Arts program today, where we will take a closer look at Jean-Claude de C. Smith's trade canoe, 40 Days and 40 Nights. I'm Sharon Reed, Programs Events Coordinator. If your device allows, you can enhance your viewing experience of this program by clicking on the viewing options next to the green bar that notes that the speaker is showing, sharing their screen. Uh, once you're there, scroll down to side by side and you should be able to view both the presentation and the speaker without overlap and you can adjust. You can minimize those speakers if you want by moving the bar either side. You may also zoom in on the presentation by adjusting your zoom ratio, which is also located under viewing options. Uh, this conversation is being recorded and will be available for viewing later on uh, on YouTube. This program will run approximately one hour today and there will be a few moments for questions from you, our audience, near the end. Please ask your questions at any time during the program into the Q&A. You don't need to wait until the end. Um, we will do our best to respond as many as we can during the time that we have. Um, now I'd like to turn it over to my colleagues, Jamie Powell, Associate Curator of Native American Art, and Neely McNulty, Hood Foundation, Associate Curator of Education. Welcome. Great, thanks so much. Um, thank you for your introduction, Sharon. And um, I know I speak for Neely and I when I also say how grateful we are for all the work that you've put in to make today's program possible. Um, we know that within um, our new world of virtual programming, that it's a really difficult task and we really do appreciate um, the work you've done for this program, but for all of our good programs as of late. So thanks so much. Um, I'd like to begin uh, today with a, um, a land acknowledgement. The Hood Museum of Art at Dartmouth is situated upon the ancestral and unceded lands of the Abenaki peoples. This acknowledgement reminds us of the significance of place, the continued existence of indigenous peoples, and the museum and Dartmouth's commitment to building respectful relationships with those who call these lands home today. Um, welcome and thank you for joining us during this challenging time. Uh, let me first say that our thoughts go out to all who have suffered with the coronavirus or experienced the loss of family, friends, or colleagues. We wish you all healing and good health. Uh, today's program is a unique and exciting opportunity for us to come together to take a closer look at Jean Quictacy Smith's Trade Canoe, 40 Days and 40 Nights. I say it is a unique opportunity because as with many things during uh, the times of COVID, uh, we're approaching our analysis and conversation today in a way that is different from how we would normally conduct such a program. Not only are we not in the galleries together, uh, but I've only seen this painting in person one time, at the end of last year in an art storage facility in New York. In fact, uh, this image and many of the pictures we'll be viewing today are from my cell phone on that very day. Uh, the painting arrived at the museum shortly before we closed to the public, and Neely and I were not able to view the work in person as we were preparing for today's program. That said, the painting provides such incredible opportunities for teaching and public engagement that we simply couldn't wait to share it with you all and to begin thinking through its complex and layered imagery together. Of course, uh, we wouldn't be able to do any of this without the generosity of Judith Lip Barker and Joseph Barker, class of 1966, who have provided us with the extended loan of this incredible painting. At this point, I'd like to turn it over to my colleague, Neely, who will walk us through a close looking exercise of the work itself. Thanks, Jamie. And big thank you to all of you out there for hanging on through the glitches initially in this program. Um, it's really such a treat to have the opportunity to introduce you to this painting today. And it's been a joy to prepare for the program. You know, with a work that is as complex as this one, each conversation that we have yields a new find, a new connection, and a new question, all hallmarks of great art for teaching. So today, my role is to be your eyes. I'll take you through an experience that models one way to engage with this work of art. I'll focus on the visual elements that we can see, and Jamie will broaden our experience with contextual information that will deepen our engagement. With a piece as complex and visually cacophonous as this one, in a museum setting, one might be tempted to look away and consult the label first for information. 
What I hope to demonstrate to you today is how to slow down, um, move your eyes systematically through the work, and build a visual inventory together. So we're going to begin broadly by zooming out. So this piece is about 13 feet long and five feet high. It is absolutely monumental. It would hold any wall or space that it occupies. It's comprised of three same size panels. But the center one has been tipped upward um, and reaches up to create a triangular composition. So, you know, when you look at this, you immediately see that the, the canoe really anchors the painting. You can see the great care that Jean has taken in composing the canoe. It's painted with long extended lines, a canoe constructed in patchwork, filled in with milky broad strokes and detailed stitching at the gunnels. Jean suggests a three-dimensional canoe form. If you can just see that long blue line, um, it really forms the canoe's interior. So with a streaky, thinned, opaque, and transparent background, we can almost imagine Jean physically creating the marks of the background um, that surround the canoe. At the bottom, we can see dozens of reddened drips that come from the base of the canoe. And some have noted in conversations that this conveys a sense of water and reflection, life outside of the canoe. Others have shared that the grays and the yellows of the background feel otherworldly, not of this place. To many, there's a sense that the canoe is hovering. Um, and this gives this, this work a sense of dynamism in life. You know, so we can really read the canoe as a site, as a place, a place crammed with forms. The high bow and the stern of the canoe act as parentheses, reinforcing the idea of the canoe as a container, as a vessel. So if we go to the center slide, Jamie. So you can see the four flattened bands of orange that zigzag up the center, dotted with floating blue circles. This is such a fabulous painting. And just off center stands an elongated lupine form with hands framing its face and vacant eyes that give it a mask-like appearance. We can see through its body, and hopefully you can see this from where you're sitting, you can see through its body to its ribs and its pelvic bones. And it has this lively bushy tail um, that you know, I imagine was a lot of fun to paint. It feels like a sentient being, um, and its scale, its pose, and its position assert its prominent role in this painting. Below it are three, and this is a little bit hard to see, but there are three animal faces. We can read the center one perhaps as a rabbit. To the right may be a wolf, an animal with a long row of bared teeth, painted in what some of us may recognize as form line design, associated with Native American artistic and cultural practices of the Pacific Northwest. All three have a mask-like appearance, wholly separated from their bodies. To their right are two human forms, drawn in a graphic style we might associate with cartoons facing each other with arms encircled and hands fanning out from their heads. Without any particularized features, it's really hard to read their genders, but what we can read is their affection and their connect connectedness. So turning to the right now. Thank you. So in this section, there's less visual clarity, in part because of the photograph itself, but also because Jean is using very little color here. The boundaries between one form and another blur as black lines overlap, and it's hard to read where one form begins and another ends. In black and white, there's, fly there's a flying skeleton. There are actually two of them, um, a snake and a leaf form. There's also a large abstracted weeping eye, a kooky set of lips with bared teeth. And within that abstract eye um, form is a drawn face and profile and a dark skull. Harder to see, are this, this series of turned heads, um, Native American figures with feathered headdresses that look like they were cut out of a clip art book. They repeat in descending size and look into the canoe. And Jamie's gonna talk about these more in a, in a minute. So going to the left panel, please, thanks. So here on the left, drawn sparingly with very few details, faces line up in layers. Is this a swimmer with goggles? Are there other swimmers above, along with fish? There's a house with a, for, with a house form in a tree, and a colored face hovers over a pattern shape. Most curiously on the left, 
is a furry horned being with a pointed tail and goatee. And it looks at us with hand upturned and points to the flying skeleton. As one coworker shared this week, this gesture in particular feels like a didactic moment, like Jean's trying to tell us something here. So with that comment, if we can pull out and look perfect, with that comment, we begin to make connections and really search for understanding. What do these forms suggest to us? What do they invite us to wonder about? How does the way Jeanne paints her cartoon style in places, overlapping forms with broad washes and layers of paint, how do these elements impact our experience of this painting? So at this moment, I'd like to mention that Jeanne Quick to See Smith is an enrolled Salish member of the Confederated Salish and Kootenai Nation, Montana. Jamie's gonna tell us more about Jean's life shortly, but as we start to wonder about Jean's artistic choices, it's important to know that she's an artist and an activist working from her own point of view. And we are each engaging with this work from our individual points of view. Some of us may be more knowledgeable about Salish cultural and artistic practices than others, and there's bound to be variety in terms of our familiarity with Native American cultural practices in general. So as a result, as you start to read these forms from your point of view, and out of respect for the cultural traditions and knowledge of this artist that may not be known to us, we invite you to wonder about the different elements rather than coming to fixed conclusions. So before Jamie hops in, I just wanna mention the title, right? Let's talk about that for a minute. Trade Canoe, 40 Days and 40 Nights. Could Jean be drawing from Christian traditions here? Is the title a reference to the biblical story of Noah and the flood? The Bible describes how God sent rain for 40 days and 40 nights to destroy a sinful humanity and to wash away the sins of the world. So that's something to think about as Jamie takes us through looking more closely at some of the motifs. Thank you. Thanks so much, Neely, and thank you for your walkthrough of the painting. Uh, as someone with a PhD in anthropology, not art history, um, I find that I'm constantly learning from my colleagues at the museum, and I really appreciate your closer examination of the process and some of the details of the painting um, and the specific references to some of the technique. Um, I'm often someone who looks at labels uh, on uh, works of art too soon. Um, and so your reminder to slow down and look at the work itself first is a really important point for all of us. Um, what I'd like to do now is dig a bit deeper into the multiple and contested meetings embedded with some of the forms or central motifs um, in this work, some of the things that you've um, mentioned, Neely. So let's begin with the canoe itself, which as you mentioned is the anchor of the painting. Um, it is a vessel um, that itself holds the painting together. Um, this work is part of the artist's larger series of trade canoes, uh, which I can talk a bit more about later. Uh, however, within the title of the series, the idea of trade um, is inextricably linked with the canoe. In communities throughout the globe, boats, ships, kayaks, and canoes serve as allegorical vessels for the transportation of people and goods, and along with them, their ideas and beliefs. These ideas and beliefs are exchanged and altered in ways that are meaningful within individual communities. Uh, sometimes these exchanges can also be detrimental and harmful. Here I'm specifically referencing ideas of colonialism and extraction. The images filling this canoe are, are uh, symbolic of the ideas and knowledge being carried within it. And as we'll see as we look at some of the other images within the canoe, the meanings can disrupt our expectations. Uh, uh, hold on, I think I went forward too soon. Uh, within this work, um, oh, no, I didn't. Here we go. Within the work, um, Jean reinterprets the biblical Ark of Noah as a canoe. However, she also replaces Noah with a figure of coyote an important being within Salish creation stories. Sent by the creator to help make the word world habitable, Coyote helped bring light to the people, among other gifts. Uh, Smith references this through the abstract depiction of the Aurora Borealis, or Northern Lights, that surround Coyote. 
However, these um, abstracted um, zigzag lines of orange and yellow um, also reference lightning and rain from the powerful storms that led to flooding within the biblical story. Um, these uh, lines and the blue circles, blue and gray circles, are also um, uh, representative of uh, what climate researchers have predicted um, around the increase of storms and powerful weather events um, as a result of global climate change. So here, um, you know, just looking at the deeper meanings embedded with just the coyote and these lines and circles, um, you know, we can see how we could spend hours unpacking this work. Um, and while that isn't possible today, I want to mention a few other things before we move on. And all of this is to really demonstrate the ways that um, Jean is disrupting our sense of time and place. And there are no easy answers within our analysis of this work, um, just as there are no easy answers to the important questions um, you know, humanity faces in our world today. Um, so just as Jean uh, transformed Noah's ark into a canoe and Noah into coyote, the plant and animal species in the vessels have been, re been reimagined through a Salish lens. This is evident um, in the form line animal figures that Neely mentioned earlier. Um, these within the center panel of the canoe include a rabbit, a wolf, and possibly a bear, although it appears um, this figure here, there are um, whiskers. Um, mm -hmm. and I, I'm not sure that that's a bear. Um, uh, these images reference the animals themselves, which exist in the geographical um, space and environment of Salish communities but also um, references um, the use of masks within cultural and social practices um, of Salish communities. So here she's speaking um, to uh, the, these forms and the ways that by inhabiting these masks and using them within certain um, cultural practices, um, Salish people, uh, uh, recognize the affinity and kinship relationships between human and non-human beings. Um, not all of the imagery um, that uh, is within this painting are based on Salish ways of knowing. However, um, as a Salish person, John is also in conversation with the art world and pop culture and mainstream media. Um, for example, um, the two figures um, holding one another um, here and holding together the center and right panels of the painting are a nod to the work of artist Keith Haring um, and his work that uh, raised awareness around uh, HIV and AIDS and also um, issues impacting the LGBTQ plus community. In the panel on the right, um, we also get a glimpse of the critical humor um, that is an important part of Jean's practice. Um, the figures pictured here um, are a series of diminishing tontos from the 1950s uh, television series, The Lone Ranger. Um, we began our discussion with the canoe as a vessel that transports people and goods, um, but also ideas. So here, Jean references the character of Tonto um, and utilizes humor to, to simultaneously provide a critique and celebration of this figure. So here she's, um, critiquing the caricature um, that uh, limits, uh, that is a limiting and misrepresentation of indigenous people um, through this media representation, but also celebrating this figure and the complicated relationship many uh, Native people have with the Tonto figure as being one of the few representations Native people might see of themselves um, during their childhoods. Um, I could go on for hours, um, and I know we certainly haven't covered um, all of the images in this work. Um, however, I'd like to turn it back over to Neely at this point um, to raise um, some questions for you all. That's great. Thank you so much. So, you know, just to summarize, we have images of death, life, humor, art history, and pop culture in this work. And Jamie's pointed out how Jean has included references specific to indigenous experiences broadly and to Jean Salish point of view in particular. 
Jean has grabbed ideas, you know, from multiple sources and created kind of a collage of cultures in a way. So we have a question for you to think about. Um, and this is it. So how do your lived experiences shape your connection and understanding of this work? Um, we would like to invite you to use the chat feature or use the Q&A um, to submit questions to us and to um, answer this question, to share your point of view. We're very interested in hearing from you. So I'm going to ask the question again. How do your lived experiences shape your connection and understanding of this work? So as we wait for you all to chime in, and we know you'll all have things to say, um, I've got a question for Jamie. So Jamie, we've had great conversations. You and Jamie, you and Sharon and I have had wonderful conversations. And this idea of generosity has come up a couple of times. That there's an open-ended, accessible quality, quality to this painting. It is a painting, you know, but it reads as a drawing. It's colorful, it's spontaneous. Um, and the canoe and the coyote figure are particularly welcoming. And they really just kind of pull us in. Can you talk a little bit about this idea of generosity? Yeah, so um, a lot of this, you know, we are asking this question about lived experiences. Um, and a lot of the generosity within Sean's work really emerged from her own lived experiences. So um, to answer that, I'm going to um, talk a little bit more about Sean herself. So uh, a self-described cultural arts worker and activist, uh, Jean Quictisi Smith is an enrolled citizen of the Confederate, Confederated Salish and Kootenai tribes, um, born of Shoshone, French Cree, and Flathead Salish ancestry. Smith is also a writer, lecturer, and organizer. Um, she was raised primarily by her father, who was a horse trader. She traveled extensively through the Pacific Northwest in California during her youth alongside her father. And while her formal education was intermittent um, due to her need to make a living, she earned um, an Associate of Arts degree in 1960, a Master of Visual Arts in 1980. Um, and during these years, she also worked as a waitress, a janitor, a factory worker, a Head Start teacher, a librarian, a secretary, and a veterinary assistant. Smith is known for addressing issues of social justice within her work, um, particularly, um, she's particularly concerned with issues impacting indigenous people of North America. Uh, she utilizes humor as a tool for confronting painful subjects, um, as in um, the rancher that's already in uh, the Hood Museum's collection. Um, her paintings invite audiences into difficult conversations and provoke reconsiderations of the visual landscapes that shape our understandings of Native Americans. Um, I'd like to share some of her words here. So this is a quote from Jean. Uh, My work is all about presenting Native American philosophy and ideology, which has been so skewed by the media that there is no semblance of reality. For over a decade, I've been using Native American icons such as buffalo, canoes, vests, war shirts, and women's dresses to tell my stories. These icons are specifically flathead Salish. The icon is a ploy in order to pull a viewer into closer range where the brum pa pa happens. What you see is not what you get. I love that closing phrase, what you see is not what you get. Um, I think it is, it also is what you get too, because if you were to, um, you know, see this painting and, you know, speak with Jean in person, and you were to have an idea about, well, I see this in, in the painting, she would say, oh, well, that's, that's what you see, that's, you know, that is, uh, you know, uh, she has such a generosity of allowing people um, to interpret um, mm her works from their own experiences and understandings of the world, that she embeds specific meanings, but also invites people um, to interpret the work, the, the work from their own perspectives um, in such a, a generous way. And it's one of the reasons why I really, um, you know, as someone with a PhD in anthropology, moved to working with contemporary art um, because there's this intellectual generosity that artists have that you just you simply don't find within academic work very often. Mm. 
Yeah, there's a, um, this piece, I, I think I've talked to you about this. It feels inclusive in a way, in, that, in the way that it invites us in to, to share our perspectives. And it's, speaking of perspectives, Sharon, now might be a great time. Yeah, I'm happy to pop yeah. in. We have a couple of um, observations here. Uh, one of them is based on the experiences in canoes, which uh, if you've never been in a canoe, they can be rather tippy. And so this person is noting that um, it almost seems like there are too many people in the canoe, um, which gives the scene a, a sense of tension for them. Um, and yeah, it really, the, um, really is, it is crammed, excuse mm -hmm. me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think, I think that there's, um, there's a sense of urgency mm -hmm. um, within the piece um, because uh, you know, she's not only referencing this biblical story and reinterpreting it through a Salish lens, but she's also making a commentary on the uh, rising sea levels and global climate change. Mm -hmm. So in some ways there's this, um, you know, sense of urgency to place all of these ideas and knowledges um, and ways of knowing, you know, within this so we can carry them um, along with us. Yeah. We have another observation. Uh, there is someone who sees the canoe as a metaphor for America and it's through history. Um, they're noting that it's a country made up of multiple cultures, indigenous and immigrant, and there seems to be a focus on colonial immigrants in the snake, like me, and the flying skeletons, which often appear on 18th century tombstones. It seems to be asking us to consider where we came from, where we are, and where we're going. Mm. I like the, I, I appreciate the reference to time. Um, I'm, my, I have a very temporal experience when I look at this one, this, this painting as well. Yeah. Um, Jamie, yeah. you had, you had a similar, you had a similar response to the flying skeletons, right? Yeah, so, you know, in thinking about how our lived experiences shape our connection to the work. Yeah. Um, before I, um, I grew up in campus in Oklahoma um, and uh, did not spend much time on the East Coast or in New England. Um, and so uh, about five years ago when I moved to Boston, I then worked at, um, spent some time working at the Peabody Essex Museum and would kind of walk around um, on my lunch breaks and go for walks. And you know, there's only so many places you can walk in Salem without seeing a cemetery or these you know, tombstones. And so um, I immediately recognized those as figures emerging from those tombstones, um, but thought about if I hadn't had that experience, I don't know that I would have recognized those figures. And I think that too is, you know, um, people in, uh, the Northwest uh, Coast area are likely more familiar with the form line design, um, but you know through her generosity and her you know desire to communicate, communicate um, across our different experiences is putting nods into these different um, figures, um, you know that have geographical and cultural um, diversity. Um, we also have someone who's noticed, noticing the, uh, the drawing of the devil on the left side of the piece and what, like this. what that might, uh, how that might be interpreted. Good question. Does everybody see that on the left? It's kind of, it's got this little barbed tail. It's hard not to say it's a cute little figure, but it's, it, 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 there's something about it. Uh, Jamie, do you have thoughts? Because it really is just sort of—it's got this hand up, and, it, and it's and it's looking right at us, right? It's it's trying to lock eyes. Yeah. Um, to me, uh, I haven't thought too much about that figure, um, but it almost it almost looks as if it's like a tactic you would see in an advertisement of like someone calling your attention to something. Yeah. 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 And, know that uh, Sean uh, often embeds critiques of capitalism within her work and so I'm kind of 
um, that's where my mind goes. But he is, he is kind of a cute little guy, a little furry guy there. Um, we have one more observation, I think, before we, we move on. Um, noting that Noah's story, uh, destruction and renewal, um, could the coyote um, be associated with creativity and destruction as well? Yeah, um, I think that, you know, if you um, do any kind of reading about, um, you know, Salish oral history and you know, broader oral histories of the Northwest Coast uh, or Pacific Northwest region, um, you'll, you'll get an understanding of Coyote as this um, figure who um, is a trickster figure and does some things that are harmful and sneaky. Um, but also um, do things like helped to steal light to bring warmth to the earth um, and light to the earth for people to be able to inhabit this, this place. So, um, you know, in a lot of ways, and there's a lot of, a lot of um, work that's been done on, you know, the, the figure of Coyote, but Coyote is, you know, this very human figure um, who does things that are naughty and uh, problematic, um, but is also has a lot of redeeming qualities. And so I think, you know, to me, the coyote figure always kind of, you know, represents uh, who we are as humans. And then even in the, the mistakes that we make and um, the things we do that may not, um, uh, you know, be, that may be selfish or otherwise that, um, you know, we're still, Kind of trying to um, live good lives and to do things in a good way. Um, but yeah, there's, uh, I think, as I'm excited to teach, uh, oh, yeah. to teach with this, and I'm excited for um, Neely and our um, education colleagues to be able to teach with K through 12 groups from this work because I, I think that um, there's a lot of ways we can, um, you know, encourage um, our audiences to kind of read some of that literature um, from uh, those areas and read some of these creation stories to get a better understanding of some of the figures within this work. Absolutely. We have one more, one final uh, experience uh, uh, that I'd like to share from someone. The reaction is that the canoe is not giving uh, giving a sense of reality. Uh, they're finding the water confused with all of the other things. Um, and the canoe seems very overloaded. I think we noticed before, someone else had noticed how crowded it seems. And so it doesn't, the work doesn't seem to give a singular message, but rather this person is experiencing it meditation. This person, can you say that one more time? This yeah, ex experiencing the work um, meditatively. Oh. Experience for them. Yeah, I appreciate that very much. And there's something, I, I, um, you know, I, I can understand, I mean, someone may experience this canoe as teetering and jammed. I feel like it can hold it, like it's gonna, it's gonna keep it together. Um, but I love that we bring different sensibilities to this. Um, um, yeah. So do you, Sharon, do you have questions that people have asked? There is, um, there is a question, um, one more before we move on. Does anyone, um, the dripping paint at the bottom, um, would, you know, would you interpret that as blood? Is it a reference possibly to America's, uh, colonial history and violence or, you know, what are the different ways that we could look at the, the dripping paint under the canoe? So I'll take it from a formal perspective, Jamie, if that's all right, before we talk about content. I see it as a technique to draw your eye to the base. And I think it makes it, 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 it makes that space, it holds it. Um, and it, and um, it makes it, the drips create this interaction with the background that's really exciting. And it adds um, repetition and energy that is similar to the gunnels where you have this repeated short marks. So as a as a artistic tool, I think it's a um, it's it's a very important part of this. I know in my conversations with colleagues, some have seen it as weeping, some have seen it as bleeding, um, 
And, and for most people, it, it conveys a sense of the physical act of painting and what it's like to manipulate um, drippy paint. Jamie, what about you? Yeah, I mean, I think, I think it is all of those things and more. Um, yeah. You know, I think, you know, one thing, and, you know, speaking of our lived experiences, I experienced this work for the first time, um, having known about Jean and her work and having had conversations with her and having studied her work um, for you know, decades. And mm -hmm. so, um, you know, the, the techniques that she was using and kind of um, with the drips, but also in kind of blurring um, the strokes um, throughout the rest of the painting um, are really kind of speaking to the kind of the ways that you cannot separate um, any of these uh, histories uh, or narratives uh, into um, things that can be easily contained or analyzed. Um, so, you know, I think it also speaks to the ways that, you know, someone mentioned that um, the canoe is kind of overloaded and, you know, makes them feel uncomfortable. Um, and I think that that's how our histories are and that's how our conversations about um, how to move forward, um, uh, you know, as a nation in a way that recognizes the rights of humanity um, and our shared humanity, we have to have some really uncomfortable um, and messy conversations about how we got to this place in order to get to a different future. And so, you know, she's layering all of these, you know, um, symbolic objects and I think at one point Neely you were talking about how um, the the figures themselves they're it's almost like a drawing oh um, yeah yeah you know, that's relevant here but because she does that because she wants to convey the complexity and the ways that these histories overlap and are entangled mm -hmm. but also doesn't want to overwhelm people she wants to keep us in that place of like uh, I often refer to as like comfortable ambiguity, mm -hmm. um, where mm -hmm. you know where we're pushed to think critically and to um, you know ch to be challenged, but it's not so. It she doesn't want it to be overwhelming to the point where we disengage with the work. Or turn away, right? That's that's lovely. Um, we do have someone who's noted that the devil appears to be at the stern of the boat where you steer um, and and considering the possibility that maybe uh, it's alluding to all of us being directed by the devil. Wow. Well, and I think that my interpretation of capitalism here fits relevant as well um again in this moment yeah i hadn't noticed um i actually hadn't thought before about like which direction the vessel was going and so i didn't i hadn't thought about the, the idea of the left being the stern um uh in some ways um all of Jean's work can also be read as landscapes too. And so even though this is a vessel um, uh, that could be going somewhere, it's also to me like a, um, there's a stillness to the vessel. Maybe that's because it's not on like open water. Um, but yeah, I actually, that's really interesting. I hadn't actually thought about um, the actual movement of the canoe just in a metaphorical sense. I think that's a good reminder of why it's important to, to have conversations with each other um, so that you see something that you may not have picked up on. That's the educator in me. I think one other um, piece of the work, and I know I mentioned earlier that um, I'm not trained as an art historian. I always like to make that clear to folks. Um, but the in the right panel, the, the weeping eye um, there, this kind of large eye, eye here, 
Um, I um, see that as kind of a reference to surrealist painting. Um, and that's not because I have spent much time studying surrealist art, um, but I happened to see a surrealist exhibition um, when I was doing some research in Chicago at the Art Institute. And um, to me, um, some of the uh, Dolly and great works that were on view, I just kept noticing the eye. Um, and then later, you know, found out that that was you know, kind of an important um, uh, feature um, that surrealist painters often uh, included within their work. Um, and so, uh, but when we were talking earlier, Neely, earlier this week, um, I thought about the mouth and I might go, let me see if I can go back. Go zoomed in on that panel. Um, so you mentioned that you saw the mouth as being part of this figure or as part of the, that maybe it corresponded to the eye, is that correct? Well, for, first you saw it in one way and I said, and I said, I, I thought that it was there, they're connected because of the scale, um, the, the mouth is, but, but you had a different way of seeing it. Yeah. Well, uh, well, at one point, the, the red lips and the color is a bit different here mm -hmm. than the other. And yeah. that is the, the fact that it's a cell phone photo and the, um, we just simply have it. We haven't even had time to get a, a high resolution photograph of this work since it's been at the museum. Um, but the, the lips are more red than this. And so I, um, it is a reference to like black sambo figures and the caricature um, and like being in conversation with these Ponto figures here. Mm -hmm. And Jamie, I don't know, or, or if you can zoom in on the two um, figures uh, that are like Keith Herring, but we have someone wondering about the, the hands over them and what those might, what that might possibly allude to? Yeah, well, I know Sharon, you had an interview. Yeah, Sharon. You <laughs> want to hear your thoughts from earlier this week? What yeah, my first, oh, my first reaction when I, when I saw the hands and the, and the two figures united is that to me, it, see, it, it appears to be a blessing. Um, I interpret it as their union, their friendship, whatever it may be, it's being blessed and, and, um, Suggesting harmony, yeah. And it makes the experience expansive, right? And in, in the herring drawing, it makes it larger and it it, it, it gives it more vibrancy. Um, yeah. Yeah, I think it also, um, in the same way that the figures are crossing the separation of the two canvases, mm -hmm. that the hands themselves kind of work to join, um, you know, these disparate canvases together. You know, and if we were in, do you mind coming to a full image, Jamie, of the work? If we were all together in a gallery um, looking at this work together in a conversation with each other, we would possibly end um, with a question such as, you know, an assessment question, sort of how do you think this is a successful work of art, um, given what we believe um, Jean may be communicating or asking us to think about, do you think it's successful? Um, and, you know, that's something that you always want to think about, to have your own sense of whether or not you're drawn to a work of art, whether you like it. Um, and, and that's just something that I want to mention before we close. So, Jamie, do you want to say anything else about this piece that you want folks to have in mind? Um, besides come and see it when it's on the walls. Yeah, I just, it, the, you know, this conversation, even in this um, strange virtual space, really kind of makes me excited um, to see the person, see the work in person for myself, um, you know, because I think that there's, you know, there's things that we just, from the image, you can't tell, like, which figure was painted first, 
um, you know, she often, um, you know, kind of creates this layered imagery, but in the, the photograph, it can be difficult to tell which layer was applied first. And so really being able to kind of um, see that, um, to see the texture of the work, um, but also just to engage um, in this kind of conversation in person, um, it can be really difficult to facilitate a conversation. Um, but clearly, um, this the work has provoked a lot of questions and ideas from our audience today. Uh, and so I just, I really can't wait to be with the work in person so people, um, you know, can share those thoughts and ideas and we can, um, you know, engage uh, in ongoing conversations uh, about the work. Great, fabulous. Jamie, maybe one more question before we go. Um, could you talk a little bit about your collecting strategy and how a work like this might fit into the plans as a loan? Yeah, so um, as I mentioned at the beginning, this work is an extended loan, um, but it is a work that, um, uh, that I would have loved to purchase for the collection. Um, uh, with our own acquisition funds. Uh, that said, um, Jean Quictacy Smith is um, one of the foremost Native American artists of the um, 20th and 21st centuries. Um, the Smithsonian American Art Museum uh, just collected their first ever uh, work of art by a Native American artist, which um, we can have another conversation about how it's about time, um, but also that um, it was a work of Jean's, um, and so she's such an important figure. Um, but I also think that, um, you know, her work, um, because of the layered and complicated meanings, lends itself to being in a teaching collection where Dartmouth students and um, our publics can engage with the work um, and our educators can use it for teaching. Um, but also uh, that the, the generosity of the artist um, in um, kind of being able to use humor and uh, collage in a way that provokes difficult conversation without being antagonistic is the most important feature of this work. And so there are other artists who um, have studied under Jean or have been mentored by her, um, whose work um, that I that I try to collect. But a lot of the work I've been, um, you know, collecting uh, since I joined the the Hood Museum have really been works that um, are able to meet people where they're at um, mm -hmm. and to um, provoke conversations about. Um, indigenous or uh, issues facing indigenous communities, but also ideas of our shared humanity and um, relationality, how we um, you know, might center indigenous ways of knowing as um, you know, a way to address issues of global climate change um, and other things that are impacting us today. I don't know if that actually answered the question, but. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Well, um, that's about it for time today. And I, I just wanted to really thank our speakers today. Thank you, Jamie. Thank you, Neely, uh, for sharing your time and your um, perspectives and insights with us. Thank you for everyone who joined us for the program today. Again, it will be available on the near future on YouTube. Um, please do take a moment to complete the survey that will go out in tomorrow's email, even if you've completed one before, because each and every program is different and your feedback is uh, perpetually helpful. Um, yes. We hope you join us next time, uh, next Wednesday, July 22nd at 1230, for a discussion on the embodiment of language with Morgan Freeman, Native American Fellow, and Thomas Price, Curatorial Assistant. To find out more about this and other programs coming up, um, you can look directly on the Hood Museum of Web Arts website. Wishing you all well and a good afternoon. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Thank you.